Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's discussion. Our guest is Mikhail Heinrich. He is a scholar and author of numerous books and articles devoted to Marxist theory, including an introduction to the three volumes of Marxist Capital, which uh, we highly recommend to anybody who's endeavoring to read through Marx's economic writings. It's an invaluable resource, as well as he's also the author of a multi-volume biography of Marx, um, the first volume of which, titled Karl Marx and the Birth of Modern Society, is available in English translation. Uh, now. So with that, Mikhail Heinrich, thank you for speaking with us today. Yeah, thank you for the invitation to, uh, to join uh, to this meeting. And uh, you asked me before to, to say some introductory words about uh, reading capital. And I know that uh, you already finished a 15 uh, session reading group about capital. I checked uh, the program of this uh, 15 or 16 sessions and I must say I was a little bit uh, surprised uh, about the order of things uh, that you start with chapter 4 and uh, chapter one about the commodity was split in several sessions at the end that you already um, at the beginning uh, were occupied with authors like Schumpeter, <coughs> Schumpeter Keynes uh, and others. Um, I when, when I do reading groups or, or even abbreviations, I, I, I did about capital, I did um, seminars at the university, I did seminars for trade unions, uh, I did introductions, where in two days I try to give an introduction in all three volumes. And uh, I tried uh, more to, um, to be more close to the order of uh, the points we can find in in uh, Marx in in Marx Capital itself, my idea about reading uh, Marx was always to read as much the original text as possible. Um, only afterwards to read some competing approaches to to compare, to come into a, a comparison. And when there is a limited time, um, then I preferred more to read a smaller selection of texts, but going more in depth. Um, and also, I think the, uh, the beginning of Capital is, and with the beginning, I, I mean, especially the first two sections, section one about commodity and money, section two about the transformation of money in capital, uh, that even when there is uh, only short time, I would spend 40-50% of this time on these first sections because they are the, the basis for, for everything else. And uh, then one had has to omit uh, some some of the later themes. In reading capital, I stressed also in in uh, my book you mentioned the the introduction in the three volumes, the difference to a uh, world view Mar <coughs> Marxism, as I called it, world view Marxism because. Um, there is a tradition of transforming the, the different approaches of Marx in a kind of comprehensive worldview, which uh, should have um, a philosophical foundation, so-called uh, dialectical materialism, which should have a theory of history called historical materialism, and it is uh, not very much paid attention to the fact that, uh, for example, these two 
uh, two terms, dialectical materialism and historical materialism, you cannot find any anywhere in Marx writings. The late Engels very casually um, used the term historical materialism, but uh, not in the later sense as a closed kind uh, of theory. And here I think an, an important issue is to distinguish what can we really find in Marx and what is attributed to Marx by a kind of uh, tradition which tries to, to construct a complete worldview which can answer uh, or which has the answer to any question you can imagine. I think this is a, a rather dangerous um, tendency and in, in history you can see many uh, political parties which defined itself as uh, uh, Marxist, socialist, communist, they used such a worldview as, um, uh, as an instrument of domination. The party or the party leaders, they have the correct view on the world coming from Marx. And when you criticize this view, then you are either an enemy or badly informed. But uh, discussion is not necessary about such points because we have the correct view uh, of the world. And I think this these tendencies um, contributed a lot to uh, disastrous uh, policies of the left and uh, also to, to a kind of disastrous way of discussing or avoiding discussion. And in so far, for me, this is not a, a philological question what is in Marx, what is not in Marx, which edition we should use. It is a political uh, question. First, how we discuss, and second, which issues we have to, to discuss. In so far, my, my um, attempt, when we talk about um, capital, when we read capital, to come close to the Marx, to, to the text of Marx, and not to use um, ready-made interpretations where we only have to fill in uh, what we find in Marx. And in so far, um, to, to come back now to uh, that what I said at the beginning, that I was so surprised from uh, the, the structure of your reading, I don't know if in such a kind of reading you can really follow the inner logic of, of the argument of Marx. You can find, of course, you can have certain issues and say, okay, what can Marx tell us to these issues? And you pick something here, you pick something from there, and you can get some information. But the attempt of Marx, what what? did Marx try in these uh, three volumes of, of Capital? I'm not sure if you can really catch this. It was not a kind of alternative political economy. Uh, it is very important to, to understand the approach of Marx uh, to produce a critique of political economy, a critique which is not only a critique of categories, uh, a kind of scientific critique. He himself spoke about a scientific revolution. Um, but it is also a critique of the way we perceive capitalism. We perceive capitalism as the natural state of, of things. And Marx tries to undermine this natural, this, this perception of capitalism as a natural order. And this, I think, is a very, is politically a very uh, important 
point. And I would say it is even for me, perhaps the most important general point. You, you can learn from Marx a lot of about um, exploitation, about crisis, about uh, the credit system and so on. But the, the general idea is to criticize the naturalization of capitalism, that capitalism is the normal, the rational uh, uh, treatment of economic problems. And this, this um, perception as capitalism as something natural is not the result of a manipulation. It is not a result of certain textbooks. It is the image capitalism itself produces spontaneously. And in so far, I think we have to, to occupy with, uh, with such structures, with this capitalist uh, spontaneity, spontaneity. And um, I think when we occupy this, this Marx capital, we have to take into account these points. Okay, now I, I want to, to stop here. Uh, it was also proposed to talk about some, some other points, Marxism and uh, the left, uh, current problems and so on. Maybe we can do this later and now have a discussion about reading uh, Capital. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, Daniel, would you like to, to jump in? Sure, thank you. Okay, so I have a question, Michael, about um, your comment about, which I agree with, um, we should not approach um, capital with ready-made interpretations or assumptions. We should read Marx. Um, so, I, so I do agree with that. My question, though, is given um, how difficult it is and how demanding it is, how long the books are and, you know, just what an immense sort of undertaking that is. Um, whether you think the following thought, you know, makes sense. Does this make sense to you? So we do need to read Capital. We need to understand, for instance, Marx's mode of exposition, the sort of way in which he and it starts with analysis of the commodity and then unfolds um, everything that it sort of presupposes, its embedding and its context and so forth. Um, we do need to understand that because if we don't, we could mistake what he's saying for a positive theory, which he's not advancing, for example. Um, but once we've done that, do you think we can, so to speak, remove the Marxian kernel from the sort of dialectical shell of the mode of exposition. I'm kind of joking with the metaphor, turning it on Marx. But once we, once we see how he's developing thoughts through the critique of political economy, um, is it possible to say something um, without all of that difficulty for beginners? Because that is sort of the intention behind, you know, much as you do in your book, you have a chapter on value, labor, money, a chapter on capital surplus value exploitation. You have a chapter on the process of production, one on circulation and unproductive labor, one on the rate of profit, interest, credit, fictitious capital, finance, crises, and so forth. Um, we need to read capital from page one to page done, but that's really hard, for instance, to get a group to do. And so it seems like you know, some cuts have to be made somewhere. So my question, just to restate it is, can we can we extract something which can be stated for beginners once we understand and appreciate the way in which Marx presents the thoughts in Capital? And um, if so, um, Why not uh, begin with, for instance, the concept of capital if we're talking to to, to working people? Um, I just would like to hear your thoughts more on that. Um, 
of course we can select something and i even the the book my my book you mentioned and you you refer to the titles you will see that uh, for example volume 2 of capital is treated there extremely uh, briefly um and also for example from book 3 uh landed uh, rent is also treated uh, um a few lines in a in a footnote even so i also omitted uh, a lot of issues uh, someone else would say oh no you should occupy more with uh, landed uh, rent um there will between persons who are occupied with Marx Capital, there will also always be a discussion, what can I omit? Uh, what is so central? You cannot omit what we can. But, okay, we have to, to make the, um, uh, the attempt. I, I completely agree with you uh, that for beginners or persons who don't want to go scientifically deep in, in capital, we must find um, more brief ways, more short ways uh, to occupy this capital than in a two-year reading group, uh, read all the three volumes. This is, uh, I agree. However, I think we have to, uh, to pay attention to some basic constructions in capital um, the order of the chapters the order of the issues is in marx not by accident it is also not by some pedagogical um, considerations oh i make it easy for the reader when i start with this or that no it has a strong um, interconnection and what you can learn in in this um considerations about money and uh, commodity and money in the first three chapters i think it is fundamental for all the rest uh, for example in chapter one second uh, subchapter about the double character of um, labor represented in commodities not embodied this i consider as a wrong translation represented in commodities marx himself stresses that this is the crucial point for understanding political economy if he is correct in this and i think there are some some arguments that he is correct then we should occupy with this before we come to to capital so in so far i argued these first two sections money and commodity and uh, transformation of money in capital for this we should pay attention at least 40 50 percent of the time we have for the whole project uh, occupying this this capital and then we can discuss about um what we shall omit uh, where we shall pay more attention or less but but these first two sections i i consider as absolutely crucial thank you uh daniel tut you're next in line thank you for your remarks um thank you also for raising the question of worldview marxism when i read your book many years ago uh that really left a big influence on me but I have uh, struggled with the concept. Gramsci wrote a, a short essay about the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which he entitled The Revolution Against Capital. You're probably familiar with it. And I think what he meant was capital and its scenario of the revolution of capitalism did not prove to be the model in which the Russian Bolsheviks were using for their success. It was rather worldview Marxism, we might call it that. We know that uh, the critique of the Gorta program was not meant to be a template for the SPD, but Engels sort of made it this way. 
We also know that major texts of worldview Marxism, such as the anti during were more popular I I I for the Second International Period than was capital, precisely because capital was too difficult for workers, according to some. So what I worry about in the abandonment of worldview Marxism is the abandonment of Leninism, is the abandonment of the political Marx. And then we then um, put capital at the center, which I'm fine with doing, but we then retroactively marginalize the political text of Marx. And we then also obliterate our tradition. No more Kautsky, no more Lenin, maybe no more Mao. And then we lose uh, the substance of wh why then does Marx say in a letter to an American Civil War general that my most, most important concept is dictatorship of proletariat. Dictatorship of proletariat is worldview Marxism par excellence, right? So my worry, and I wonder if you agree, is that we risk excising the pol political Marx when we abandon worldview Marxism. Okay, I can, um, I, I start uh, from behind. I completely agree with you that it would be a disaster to abandon the political Marx. Um, However, I would not uh, see such a strong um, connection between the political Marx and worldview Marxism. The political Marx, when you read uh, his many smaller articles, was also a struggle against what I call worldview Marxism. He didn't use uh, such a vocabulary, but I think he already fought against um, what I criticize when I use this term. Um, in so far, I think we have to do two jobs. The one job is to see what happened with this worldview Marxism in the history of workers' movement, of uh, political parties, of workers. When it started in the late um, 1880s, 1890s, at the end of 19th century, I think it it was a part, um, it, it was a kind of need of the working class itself. There was not a conspiracy of some leaders and, oh, let's invent such a worldview uh, Marxism. The The working class, especially in Germany, was excluded from the bourgeois society. And they started to construct their own society. You had workers' sports club, workers' chess clubs, workers' uh, singing uh, clubs, and so on and so on. Even the, uh, the petit bourgeois uh, culture was copied. The conservative middle class had a portrait of the German emperor in the dining room, and the German working class had a portrait of August Bebel, the leader of the Social Democrat, in the dining room. And in so far, the, there was a, a kind of need from the working class to have a proletarian worldview, which was in contrast to the bourgeois worldview. On the other hand, this worldview Marxism, which um, was taken in parts from Anti During, you, you mentioned it, but also from the writings of Karl Kautsky and, and others, this worldview Marxism in the next decades became uh, an instrument of domination in the parties. It was not something neutral. It, it was really a, um, an instrument of domination, of repression. And I think this we have to criticize today. This shouldn't repeat in, uh, in our political practice. With the political marks, this is the other job we have to do. Uh, we have to, to discuss, to reconstruct it, 
exactly like we do with uh, with capital. In my work, I was mainly focused on capital, on the economic writings, on the the development of the the notion of capital from Grundrisse to to the book capital and so on and so on. This does not mean that I ignore the the political marks. Um, it just means um, I'm not able to occupy at the same time with very different uh, issues, which are all necessary. I try to to fill some gaps, especially with this biographical project, which is not a, bi a biography in a narrow sense, presenting the life and the adventures of Marx. It is also a history of the works of Marx, of the development of the works of Marx. And there, uh, the political Marx is very important. And I, I search for this political Marx not only in the well-known texts like 18th Primaire or um, Civil War in France. We also can find this political Marx in the hundreds, really hundreds, of newspaper articles where Marx was dealing with very actual uh, political issues, but always with a more general um, uh, uh, view in, in his mind. So I would even say the political Marx is until now not completely discovered. It what is discussed is a lot about of state from Lenin to Gramsci to to Althusser to Kulanzas, but this is only a part of the texts of the political Marx. And with this biographical project, I also intend to bring to attention uh, texts which until now are not in the center of the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Robert, you're up. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Um, this is going to dovetail a bit on, on Daniel's comment just, just now, Michael. So I have um, in some ways the same concern that Daniel has. I'm always worried about throwing, off the, throwing out the proverbial baby with the, with the bathwater. Uh, on the one hand, um, when we sort of look critically at the, the sort of po post-Marxian uh, legacy. Um, but it seems to me that there's a particular way to avoid that um, that does uh, pays appropriate homage both to Lenin uh, and uh, to Marx himself. And that is, I think, to sort of recontextualize Marx or to sort of reappropriate and re-understand the context out of which he emerged, not with the view to saying, like, Sperber, oh, he's a 19th century guy, he's irrelevant now, has nothing to say to us now, but in order better to understand the nature of even certain key words that he uses, right? So one thing that makes it possible for some foolish people today to think Marx was an economist and that he's sort of in the same discussion with Adam Smith and David Ricardo and others uh, is simply the the, the mistake of, of, of overlooking the word critique, right? K-R-I-T-I-K. Um, and what it's helpful, it seems to me, for people to remember is what the word critique meant at that time and the context out of which it emerged, right? This is a time, about a 50 to 60 year period, when everybody from Kant all the way through the Hegelians and the left Hegelians and so forth is critiquing everything. And the idea isn't just criticizing as in being negative about it or negating it in a, in a Hegelian sense, but properly interpreting it, pro properly understanding its sort of esoteric meaning, what's embedded in it, what what is it taking for granted, what is it revealing about those who are engaging in whatever it is that, that we're critiquing. And so the critique of capital is very much to be understood sort of by analogy with the critique of pure reason, or with Bruno Bauer's critique of Christianity, right? Or with Feuerbach's critique of religion in general, or and so on and so forth. Um, and then you know right away, right, that, that Marx isn't in the same line of work, so to speak, as Max Weber or Adam Smith or any of those fools who people, I think, really to besmirch Marx when they put him next to and sort of compare him to as though he were playing the same game or entering the same discourse. 
Now, it seems to me that also helps us understand the mistake of certain forms of materialism, or at least um, certain attributions of materialism, right? So, when we talk about dialectical materialism or historical materialism, it's not that we're um, just being materialistic. We're also saying this is a particular kind of materialism that's to be understood in contraposition to things like metaphysical materialism that Marx and Engels and Lenin were all at pains uh, to rebuff, right? To, to, to sort of declare as being pretentious. It's not a metaphysical claim uh, to say I'm a dialectical materialist. And I think a mistake maybe of some of the worldview Marxists is to mistake a dialectical materialism or an historical materialism as a kind of metaphysic, as a kind of view on what the world is constituted by or what the future, what the furniture of the universe really is. It's not that at all. And Lenin, to its credit, understood that as well, right? He is, I mean, probably is no greater exponent of the dictatorship of the proletariat or actual practitioner of putting Marxist revolution into practice than Lenin. And yet there's also no greater, um, uh, ad, um, how should I put it, uh, emphasizer of the need to understand Marx's historical background and understand Hegel and his logic in particular, to understand Marx and to understand capital. And nobody would accuse um, Lenin of being a, a kind of egg-headed armchair philosopher type reading Hegel. He read Hegel with specific revolu uh, practical revolutionary aims in view. And so for what it's worth, it seems to me um, that what we need to do, I suppose, uh, both to combat historical, um, I'm sorry, um, worldview Marxism, and to make sure that in combating it, we're not uh, jettisoning uh, the practical Marx and the revolutionary Marx and the political Marx, and worse yet, his progeny, is to sort of rehistoricize him on the one hand, while continuing to emphasize the continuing importance and relevance and indeed crucialness of it on the other. And I wonder if you think I'm overlooking anything and suggesting that, or it, I, am I giving bad advice when I make that suggestion to, to friends and colleagues? Um, regarding historizing Marx, I, I completely agree with you. Um, it's very funny that uh, you, you also mentioned this, that Jonathan Sperber in his Marx biography stresses so much that Marx is a guy from 19th century. Okay, what a guy who was born in 1818 died in 1883. What he should be when not a guy of 19th century? The much more interesting question is, what does 19th century has to do with our present times? 19th century was the time where capitalism installed itself as the dominating uh, mode of production. It was also the time where the basic structures of um, the bourgeois state um, what were installed and Marx was an observer of, of these processes. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think when, when we are clear that, when we have clear that some superficial forms, of course, changed, but that the basic structure of the capitalist mode of production and the basic structures of the bourgeois state, uh, came into reality in this 19th century, then uh, it's a recommendation when we say Marx is a guy of 19th uh, century. Mm -hmm. However, what we should um, perhaps a little bit uh, uh, stronger uh, pay attention to it than you do it, or I, I didn't hear it, I don't know. All Marx writings, even what seems to be the most theoretical writing, were interventions in certain debates, in certain mm -hmm. political conflicts. It was not meant as a contribution to an eternal discourse about uh, politics and the truth or, or whatever. They had all a very concrete meaning. Yeah. This worldview, Marxism, has the ten tendency to transform the concrete contributions of Marx in such eternal uh, uh, contributions. And because we nowadays have a lack of historical knowledge, we don't know at once which were the conflicts, the debates in which Marx wanted to intervene. Mm -hmm. 
So in order to, to occupy with his texts, texts, we also have to reconstruct the, the um, political context. And this is also one of the tasks I have in this biographical uh, concept to put Marx in the history, but not in the sp Sperber-like way in order to say, okay, this old guy is only interesting for some historians. No, to put it in the historical context in order to see how much this historical context has to do still with our uh, present conditions. And in so far, Marx in, in some respect is a very present guy and not this this old historian guy yeah thanks michael yeah just a quick follow-up i mean I, I i it's always seemed to me that nobody has been more ready to revise um himself than than marx himself over time right i mean his opinions on the uh, ripeness of Russia for revolution, for example, changed markedly toward the end of his life once he began talking to actual Russian revolutionaries. He was anything but dogmatic, even about his own most key insights, it seems to me. And therefore, it seems to me he's a great practical lesson to all of us on how actually to regard the world around us and how to engage with it critically and respond to changes in that environment, even when they're happening in ways that we didn't predict five years ago or 10 years ago. But thanks. Thank you. Um, so I think uh, well, when I can just add a, a, a short mm -hmm. remark, I sure. I forget. It is true that Marx changed uh, sometimes his view. He was a lifelong learning person who, even in in an age of uh, late fifties, learned. Russian language in order to read at least economic uh, literature in in Russian. And uh, you all know that so many uh, manuscripts of Marx were not published at his lifetime. N sometimes he, he couldn't find a publisher. But in most cases, he himself didn't want to publish because he thought no... Uh, now I, I, my, my mind has changed. I, I first I have to change these texts before I can publish it. But this also has a consequence for us. When we read Marx, we should not uh, follow such a strategy to pick from everywhere what we like. We have to see the development of Marx, the changes in his argumentation. And when we pick something from one text or one manuscript, we should have in mind what happened later, how it was uh, developed. And this is also not a, a very easy task uh, when we occupy with Marx. All right, uh, Daniel, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I, I had a quick follow up. Um to the to uh, the to this topic and some of the things that followed from my question so i i i can't disagree uh that we must see the development in marx's exposition and uh the way you put it we were speaking before you know we need to make this um simple so people can understand without simplifying it that's that's very true and in the spirit of that that that's why i want to ask this question um you know, if, if we're interested in getting Marx right, we have to read it all very carefully. But that's an interest in Marx. And there's another interest which organizations like this one are committed to um, having a sort of, you know, first order understanding of the way that the world is. And um, so I, I do sort of confess that the, it might seem like a sort of flat-footed approach to just sort of try to extract the explanatory framework, which I understand you might contest because it's a critique of political economy. It's not just a positive theory. I totally concede that, and that is obviously true. And, and we've gained so much on this from reading your book, but one of the things that we've gained from reading your book is also an insight on what Marx would say about first-order empirical questions in capitalism and understanding capitalism. So um, when the priority is understanding capitalism, it seems that um, 
you know, at the end of the day, after we've done all of this interpretive reconstruction work, there had better be a positive theory, even if it's not just a positive theory. It's not just a positive theory. It's a critique of political economy as such. It's doing something different than they were doing. Although I wouldn't quite say that Adam Smith or Max Weber were fools. Um, putting 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 Marx next to, for instance, on the on the list we have there, Schumpeter and um, Keynes about the importance of the money uh, in order to show analogs in other you know disciplines. Um, in a way, couldn't we argue one of the great things about Marx is that he saw the necessity of money, the fundamentally in capitalism, in capitalism, that capital has a fundamentally financial side that we can't abstract from money and still understand capitalism. And I understand that this is sort of a first order approach, which is kind of basic or simple minded, or let's say. And, and and I grant all of these points that, you know, if we're going to get Marx right, we have to do the work. But, I mean, don't you think that, though, once the work is done, what it yields ha ought to be an understanding of the world in which we live and help us understand it, in which case we can see, you know, Marx anticipated Keynes by 60 years. Um, that seems like a valuable insight, Um so I wonder what you think about about this question of, you know, for a political organization, we need a positive theory, and we can't always. Not all of us can do the work that the theory that Marx's writings require. I would just like to hear what you think more about that. Okay, to to start with this last point, what do we need for a political organization? Um, and who needs an extensive uh, scientific occupation with Marx. I don't see there a big um, contradiction. For example, my introduction of uh, in, into the three volumes of Capital, I couldn't write this um, just after reading Capital intensively. I, I did, in fact... Um, in the year 1980, I I wrote my first commentary to to Capital, which never published, because at the end of this, it it was a, a manuscript of uh, around 200 uh, pages. After finishing this manuscript, I came to the result that I have a lot of misunderstandings, shortcomings. So it, it was for me the method to, to go a step further. And uh, this introduction I published many years later, I could only write after I had written my Signs of Value, a uh, 420-page, uh, very scientific, uh, very meticulous uh, study about the development of Marx's economic uh, theory. So you need, I think, a, a scientific approach in order to take out the basic things in a way that it is presented simply, but without losing too much of its complexity. Um, and then I think it is a, it is an offer. You must see what, what people want. Some people say, okay, I want some basic knowledge, positive knowledge. What is capitalism? How capitalism works? Is a capitalist crisis such an, uh, only an accident which can be prevented by a correct policy? Or is it, necessarily uh, combined with, with capitalism, for example. On all these points, you can deliver rather simple um, answers. Simple, I mean, in the, in the way that they can be understood without an enormous uh, um, study. However, the, the critical aspect has also in this basic knowledge to be present. When you come to, to an issue like fetishism, and I think it is essential 
even on, on the most uh, basic level. This includes to show that talking about value means at the same time to, to criticize what is value in, in a capitalist uh, society. Um, when you want to do more, when you want maybe to, to do some educational work, then you need more uh, knowledge. Then this very basic material is not enough. When you want to do research, empirical research about capitalism, then you need even more. So I would say it is a, a kind of, of staircase. It is not a, a break here the science or the scientific approach and here the the popular approach no it is a a kind of staircase from very basic knowledge to the most advanced scientific uh, discussion about marx and everybody must decide for herself or himself where in this staircase I would be, and many persons who at, at the beginning said, oh, I want to, to have some basic knowledge, say, oh, it's interesting, and I think I need some more, and they, they climb up this uh, staircase. And what persons like, like I can do, who spend so much time in, in studying Marx, is to, to, to try to give some helping tools for, for such persons. Thank you. Uh, Hef, you're next on stack. Uh, I'm not sure if I understood you at the beginning. You, you opened the floor to questions about uh, reading capital, right? I wanted to ask you a question about Marx's value theory. Would that be all right? Um, you uh, spend a lot of time in, in your book, The Introduction to the Three Volumes, on getting the value theory right. And you say that um, most traditional Marxists uh, misunderstand the value theory of Marx by interpreting it as similar to previous political economists, such as David Ricardo and Adam Smith. You call those conceptions uh, substantialist or pre-monetary value theories, and you say that Marx Marx's value theory is a fundamentally monetary value theory. So in, in just a few words, could you summarize what you think are, are the fundamental mistakes that um, Marxist interpreters make when they misinterpret the value theory? And what do you think needs to be done to correct um, those misunderstandings? I... I can do this uh, rather shortly, rather briefly, uh, in, <clears throat> in the words uh, of Marx himself. In theories of um, uh, surplus value, Marx has big um, uh, sections about Ricardo, and he, he estimated Ricardo very high. Uh, however, he criticized Ricardo in exactly this point that he said, yeah, Ricardo and also Smith, they understood uh, the connection of labor and value, but they didn't understand that this labor, meaning labor which is represented in uh, commodities, must express itself in money. He didn't use the, the vocabulary monetary theory, pre-monetary theory. But when you take this critique against Ricardo seriously, that he missed why labor must express itself, this labor express itself in, in money, then you have the core of what I, <coughs> I call, <coughs> sorry, what I call monetary theory of, uh, of value, that it is only the first step to say we have commodities, 
commodities are produced by uh, human labor. We have to distinguish abstract labor and uh, uh, concrete labor. Um, what counts for value is not the individually spent labor, it's the socially necessary labor time and so on. So everything what you can find in the first subsection of the first chapter, it is really only the first step. And then we have also the third subchapter about value form. That value must be expressed in a general form. This for decades was completely ignored. And this is the basis to understand the necessity and the importance of money. And the ignorance of value form analysis had the consequence that for decades, Marxists, with some exceptions, but I would say the, the biggest part of the Marxists, ignored money. They treated money very similar to the way money was treated by Adam Smith or by David Ricardo. But this, exactly this treatment of Smith and Ricardo was in the center of Marx's critique against them. So I, I hope I, I cannot, it, it, I know it's very, uh, very short what I said, very brief, but to, to say more, then I, I need also a little bit uh, more time, but I, I hope the direction became clear what I mean with monetary theory of uh, value. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, George, you had your hand up several moments ago. Are you still here? I am. Um, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, I just want to ask a qu um, what I wanted to ask is, should capital be written, uh, be read as a, um, quote unquote scientific work? And is there any reason to approach, say, social sciences like economics, different from a natural science. Okay, when I understood correctly, you have two questions. Shall capital read as a scientific work? And second, is there um, a difference between social science and natural science? Correct. Correct? Okay. Um, of course, it should be read as a scientific work. Marx himself stressed this. He Marx uh, himself treated um, or, or um, respected science very much. When we think of his uh, critique against Malthus in the theories of surplus value, where he said, oh, this Malthus, he tries to subordinate the science to some exterior um, Aims this um, okay. I, I have no English translation in in German. He said, "Such a person I call gemein, meaning it, it's a mean person to doing this." So Marx had a very high ethos of uh, science, and uh, when you remember the preface to the first volume, at the end Marx wrote every judgment of scientific critique is welcome. And I think uh, he meant this very seriously. It's, it was not a, a kind of arrogant uh, phrase to say, okay, try to criticize me, you will have no uh, success. No, not at all. Marx wanted scientific discussion. He wanted scientific uh, uh, critique. In so far, we have to, to to read and also to criticize, if necessary, capital in a scientific way. On the other side, capital was not meant as a um, contribution to the eternal wisdom of human mankind. In um, April 67, when Marx just finished the last part of volume one, and uh, gave it to the publisher, he wrote to, to an old friend, Johann Philipp Becker, in a letter, this book 
is the strongest missile. He used the English term missile in the German letter. The strongest missile ever thrown against capitalists and landowners. So he, uh, uh, he attributed to capital a political importance, a political weapon, but not in a difference to the scientific character. The other way around, because capital was a scientific verb, it could be a useful uh, political weapon. In so far, we have to do both. We have to, to read it as a scientific verb and we have to discuss the political consequences. About the difference between social science and, um, and natural science, um, at first, on a very general level, there is... Uh, in in both fields, the necessity for strict um, scientific rules. There is a when you do science, it's a, a difference between opinion and a scientifically justified uh, judgment. On the other hand, uh, this scientific character doesn't guarantee something like absolute truths. Uh, in, in, in the social sciences, uh, this is much more uh, accepted than in natural sciences. But when you see the development of natural sciences, that Newtonian physics was seen for 200 years as the physics, where it seems uh, it cannot be replaced by anything. And it was replaced by the theories of relativity and uh, quantum mechanics. You see that there are also scientific revolutions in like you have in, in social sciences. And in these scientific revolutions, the criteria change what is science what is a scientific proof and this criteria change is not a purely scientific change it is also a kind of social change and in so far there are a lot of differences but on a very general level i i see a lot of similarities or, or parallels between social sciences and uh, natural sciences. Um, one of, maybe getting back to the question of how do we approach Marx's work as an explanatory framework. And I think one of the most immediate objections people may raise when proposing that we read capital to understand the modern world is, well, that was 150 years ago. Like the way you understand economies in the 1860s surely doesn't say anything about, you know, 2020s. Like that's a very common way to think of it, I think. And so, I mean, one of the things that strikes me and especially looking at the later volumes of capital is how central finance is to Marx's argument. And so I'm wondering, what would you say to the suggestion that we could use Marx's theory to understand something like the 2008 crisis? Does Marx still have, um, Marx's economic theory still have explanatory value in such a contemporary context? Or do you think that we would need to introduce different principles to make sense of such things? Um, both. I could answer your last question very simply with both, um, but I, I, I will not be so brief. Um, your first question, uh, what can we uh, answer to persons who say, okay, 160 years ago, so what? Uh, we have to discuss what is really the object of Marx capital. If it would be the British capitalism of uh, mid 19th century, then it is clear um, Marx Capital wouldn't have very much meaning today. It would be a book for the historians of uh, economic development. But Marx claim what he wanted to analyze was not the British capitalism. It was what he called at the end of um, the manuscript for volume three, the capitalist mode of production 
in its ideal average. Ideal average. I think this is he used this term only one time, but on in a very important context. Uh, ideal average means he wants to analyze what necessarily belongs to capitalism. He, he didn't want to analyze the specific historical form in this time, in this country, but what belongs necessarily. He also mentions this in the preface, where usually an author says something, what is the, the content of my book? And here he's uh, in, in the preface, he mentioned uh, that he doesn't want to, to present the higher or lower degree of capitalist development. He wants to present the laws behind this development. And then he also added that uh, he took his examples mainly from England because it was in his times uh, the most advanced uh, capitalist country. But these are only illustrations, he wrote, for my theoretical development. So Marx's presentation is on a very high level of abstraction, the ideal average of capitalist mode of production. This has advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of this high level of abstraction is that we can use his book today. We still live in capitalism. The basic structures of capitalism still working. A lot of superficial moments have changed, but the basic structures remained. And in so far, and oh, I, I should also say in so far Marx was successful in presenting this ideal average, in so far his book is useful. But the disadvantage, it is not an analysis of a concrete capitalist country, a concrete capitalist um, uh, economy. So not only today something more is necessary, also when in Marx's lifetimes you want to do a study about crisis in England, you need more than capital because capital is on this level ideal average. In every time you need more than, than capital, but this, and than Marx's capital, but this more is based on Marx's capital. So, let's be concrete with the financial crisis. We can use the categories of Marx. What is interest? Interest is a part of the cross uh, profit. It is not of the brute profit. It is not a category by itself. Uh, Marx introduced this category of fictitious capital, what has specific differences to industrial capital. All this we can use. However, the, the section on finance and credit is incomplete. Incomplete not only in a quantitative sense that Marx didn't manage to complete the manuscript, it is also incomplete in a qualitative sense. Marx, uh, in the whole capital, in the whole three volumes of capital, thought that a money commodity is absolutely necessary for the capitalist mode of production. He saw the limitations. He saw very clearly that the money commodity brings a lot of problems for the um, capitalist mode of production, but Marx believed that it is impossible to abolish this money commodity. This is one of the points where his analysis didn't meet the ideal average. In, this is a point where Marx confused a special historical um, shape with this ideal um, 
average. 20th century proof first that the money commodity could be abolished. Nowadays, the, the system of money, of currencies, is not depending on, on a money commodity. And this just started in the lifetime of Marx that the national banks, like the Bank of England, transformed itself in what we call today a central bank, which main issue, the main, main um, function is to issue the non-commodity money. In so far, also on the categorical, on the, on the level of categories, in this point, we have to, um, to go beyond Marx. We have to in, uh, include not only what Marx called national bank, but what nowadays we call central banks and the, the function of central banks. And also when we want to, to concretely analyze the, the crisis of 2008, we have to see what were the conditions of the world currency uh, system in the year 2008. And this was rather different from the world currency um, system of Bretton Woods, for example. So we have to do a lot of additional empirical and also theoretical work, but nevertheless, this additional theoretical work is based or should be based on the analysis uh, of Marx in Capital. Thank you. Uh, Robert, your hands up. Yeah, um, first, um, just as a former uh, Fed employee and a former IMF employee, I have to endorse what you just said uh, very enthusiastically. But I wanted to pose you a quick question. Um, it, it seems to me uh, that your emphasis on the monetary theory of value is one of the most important of your emphases that has been entirely overlooked, indeed embar embarrassingly overlooked, by many who think of themselves as Marxists on the one hand, and by many who think of themselves as critics of Marx on the other. And it seems to me that overlooking the mon what you call the monetary theory of value is uh, the principal problem, I think, that vitiates uh, Fred Mosley's otherwise uh, wonderful work. I wonder if you agree with me also, uh, though, uh, that we can basically attribute the so-called transformation problem, or really the transformation non-problem, to the same error. In other words, if one were to adhere or were to attend carefully to what you call the monetary theory of value, one would never fall into the trap of thinking that there was a transformation problem, because one would never think that Marx was trying to put forth a theory of value in the sense that political economists before him were doing. Yeah, um, I agree with you at least in parts, perhaps uh, totally, but we have to add something. Mm. The transformation problem is really present in volume three. We cannot deny, we cannot say there is no problem. And the funny point is that Marx himself recognized this. There is uh, this sentence. Um, okay, I, I don't know now when we talk about the transformation problem, if everybody understands what we are talking about uh, in, in volume three. Um, Marx comes to the result that uh, when every single capital um, uh, gets the surplus value produced with this capital, then we have different profit rates. And of course, uh, for capital, it plays no role in which branch uh, you make profit, you want to do the, the highest profit. In so far, there must be a, a tendency for equalizing the, the profit rates. But equalizing the profit rates means that the market prices are not any more similar to values. The, the oscillation points of market prices must diverge uh, from values. And this caused the problem, how can we come from values to production prices? Marx tries to illustrate this with a number 
example where he trans didn't transform the inputs but only the outputs but this is obviously nonsense when all the outputs are given in production prices you cannot get anywhere inputs for the production at values and marx recognized this he said yes of course mistakes can happen but this is not the point for the moment he thought it is a very um small detail which played no role the discussion later showed it plays a very crucial role it is not so so easy and indeed now i make a big jump uh in this um monetary theory of value i try to show in in my book science of value that we can omit this transformation problem it is not when when we try to fix it as a quantitative problem we will always run in in problems we cannot solve but this is absolutely not necessary it's a problem of transforming categories it's a problem of quality not of mm. quantity however marx in the manuscript of the third volume saw this as a problem of quantity he tried to solve this quantitative problem and i interpret this in um, in science of value as as a result of one of the ambivalences of marx capital marx on the one hand did a scientific revolution a break a fundamental break with the theoretical field of classical political economy but in doing this in scientifically executing this scientific revolution he was still fixed to some points of this theoretical field he already had overcome this is a very usual thing when you um, occupy the scientific revolutions you will see the same case with galileo galilei and uh, the the emergence of modern physics in so far we have to to consider these ambivalences we have to identify them we have to 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 remove them to criticize marx with the help of marx and this i try to do in my treatment of the um transformation problem to to make clear it is not a quantitative it is a qualitative problem this can happen without any problems but it has also consequences we cannot speak quantitatively about values under capitalist conditions value is then just a, a step in understanding in constructing notions of the capitalist mode of production but we cannot imagine that we have two different quantitative systems a value system and a production price system and we have to find a uh, an an mathematical algorithm to come from the one quantitative system to the other but this many marxists uh, refuse they say no we need a quantitative uh, theory of value but i yeah. would say um it's like this old rolling stone song you cannot always get <laughs> what you want Yeah, it seems like a common. It's common for category mistakes like this to be made when a new science is being born of an old one. When the when the when the new creator is to some extent still a little bit indebted to prior categories that he's systematically replacing, he sometimes can lapse into the momentary category mistake. And it seems to be you're right, right? It's 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 essentially a categorical difference, right? His his idea of value is categorically distinct. It's not on the same level, so to speak. Not talking about the same kind of thing. as the so-called value theory of early political economy it seems to me but i'm i'm thrilled to hear you say this i i it, i was always wondering if i was sort of right in sort of thinking this um and it seems to me that um maybe i am then because you you put it so well thanks
Thank you. Uh, we're coming up on the 90 minute mark. So I just want to make sure, Mikhail, do we have time for a few more tech questions? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, Daniel, you have a direct response to the previous discussion. Then it's Hef and George on Stack. Sure. Okay. Thanks. So initially, I didn't really want to get into the, I didn't know if we should get how far into the weeds we should get, but we're in the weeds. Um, and I had a few questions come up in the series of previous um, uh, interactions. And so I was wondering, so on this topic of the transformation problem, and you, you were saying how, you know, if we picture it as two distinct systems of labor quantities and, and exchange values, then only then does one start to wonder, how do you transform this one into this one? And only then do you have the problem of uh, whether or not it can work. But, you know, if you start with a monetary theory of value and you have a single system, then that that problem seems to be a problem of interpretation. Obviously, this is very appealing for Marxists. Um, I think, though, you you know what you 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 rightly remark. Some Marxists are strangely committed to this other view, which looks more like Ricardo. But um, so, what I wanted to ask you is, in this case where um, so abstract labor. Um, so the the question is about the two systems and on the one hand, and abstract labor and concrete labor on the other. Um, you you give a very prominent uh, position to this quotation uh, from Marx, where he says, you know, the labor that goes on in production is reduced to uh, abstract labor, in gen human labor in general, the substance of value, only sort of indirectly when the products of labor are exchanged as commodities on the market, of course, vis-a-vis -vis money. And so if abstract labor only comes into the picture when it's the products of actual, you know, ordinary labor are exchanged against money, then there's no question. It could never possibly predetermine, no one could ever even think that Marx would suppose that human labor in general pre is supposed to predetermine exchange values. Um, and so I guess my question is, that seems like a perfect example, a perfect example of how Marx is doing two things usually. He's crit criticizing his predecessor. So in this case, he's saying, you know, Ricardo takes for granted human labor in general, but he doesn't give an explanation of it. But Marx is actually presenting one there in a rather roundabout way. How do we get this human labor in general? Well, monetary exchange of products of labor as commodities. And on the other hand, he's presenting a positive view. And so I guess what I'm asking is, do you would you agree that that's a good example of critiquing his predecessors, but also indeed actually giving a positive view? It's not just a critique. It's also a positive view. Okay, um, you mentioned this also uh, before, the, the relation between critique and positive uh, view. We need um, a positive theory, I feel, so this is my motivation. Yeah, but I, I think um, someone else before mentioned this, uh, that Marx's notion of critique has... Uh, a lot of uh, in in common with uh, Kant's notion of critique, and there is even a, um, from 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 the wording a, a very strong parallel critique of pure reason, critique of political economy, and uh, critique in this sense was not restricted to prove uh, that you are wrong. You say two plus two is five, and I say, oh, I criticize this. Two plus two is four. Um, this sometimes also happens in in Marx, and he um, he's very proud when he can find some kind of mistakes in in well known economists. But the main thing, uh, the the main use of critique is more this fundamental critique to say, oh, in your reasoning, you have um, assumptions which are not clear to yourself and which or which you cannot make clear uh, to the audience. These assumptions have certain consequences 
for your uh, argumentation. So in a formal sense, your the logic of your argumentation is correct, but you don't consider which are your real assumptions, for example. This means critique. And this always um, implies that you say something to, to the content. The critique in this sense is not only, oh, you are wrong. For example, critique of pure reason was in, in, in Kant a critique of metaphysics of his time. And in his time, metaphysics counted as a science. And he criticized the basic assumptions of metaphysics of his time. And from this critique, derivated was a new uh, um, view of human thinking, of uh, conceptualizing some old problems like God or soul. We cannot treat these problems on the level they were treated in the past. But other things, the the forms of, um, now I don't know the, the English terms, um, Formen der Anschauung und des Denkens, the forms form of intuition of and perception thought, yeah. and, and uh, thinking. Here, a completely new field is opened. In so far, um, I don't see a contrast. I, I, I don't see a contradiction. I, I not even see a contrast between this meaning of critique and this, what you call positive science. Nevertheless, I avoid the word positive science because it you you have as an association very simply a positivist empirist science where you just have to take some empirical data put them together and then the problem is um, is solved with this this is not the concept of science according to marx in so far in order to to avoid such misunderstandings, I don't uh, use uh, positive science. But when, when I say Marx is analyzing the capitalist mode of production, then it is clear this is more than to criticize some economists that they came to wrong uh, judgments. Okay, thank you. Yes, I certainly didn't mean... Um logical empiricism, positivism, and also not um, like a positive, normative, prescriptive policy program, rather just simply a view, with uh, an account which explains why the world is as it is. Um, yes, but I, you, 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 I, I, um, your point is well taken. I, I didn't uh, suppose that you mean this. Um, but you have on the one hand persons with an empirist background, they use this term. On the other hand, you have a certain, at, at least in Germany, a kind of tradition uh, in, in the line of Adorno, who stresses, we cannot really say, or when, when we say something in, in this analytical sense or what you call positive sense, then it is already a kind of betrayal. We are already on the wrong um, on the wrong line. So you are um, between two extremes uh, when when you are in in this discussion. And this I try to avoid. That my position is neither identified with the one extreme nor with the other extreme. Um, but it, it's it's a difficult job. Uh, thank Hef, you. Thank right. you. Hef, go ahead. I did want to ask a more practically oriented question. Uh, I know that um, Marx's uh, capital is meant as a scientific project to describe, um, to identify and describe the laws of capitalism, and we shouldn't expect a description of a state of affairs to lend itself to 
uh, positive policy or political prescriptions. Uh, but we shouldn't be surprised if they do so either. Um, for example, the, the Keynesian conception of economics uh, lends itself to a certain policy prescription. Um, you know, crises are caused by weak aggregate demand and policies um, that correct that are usually the Keynesian variety. Neoclassical economics um, describes things in terms of supply and demand, and it's often uh, used to justify a, a policy of austerity or, or cutting wages. In your view, um, is there a set of uh, political programs um, that uh, are, are justified or supported by your interpretation of Marx? Um, I think here the problem is not my interpretation or a uh, much different interpretation. Uh, the first question is, what do you mean this political program? What is the aim of, of political program? When there is a, a capitalist crisis with um, big unemployment, loss of um, income and so on. Then you can say political program to minimize the effects of uh, such a crisis. And we can discuss uh, what would be measures, political measures to minimize these effects, what kind of measures uh, would increase the effects. For example, austerity mostly increases the, the effects. The Keynesian measures mostly minimize the effects. Um, okay. When you say, okay, we want to overcome capitalism, when this is meant with political program, then I cannot say, oh, we have to do this or that uh, political uh, um, e economic policy. So the first point is, what aim do we have? Do we have to minimize social problems in a capitalist condition? Then we can discuss about certain measures. Do we say, we want to not only to minimize problems, we want also at least to go one step beyond. Then we have to, to discuss about what are steps beyond. Steps which are not abundant, the capitalism, but which go beyond. Is there something? Some persons say, no, there is only revolution or nothing. I would say there is a little bit more than only revolution. For example, we have this uh, nice example in Berlin. Um, we have big problems uh, on the housing markets. Uh, the rents are uh, very quickly increasing. The long time they were comparatively low for such a, a center like Berlin. But in the last 10 years, they incredibly uh, rise. Even for a well-paid middle-class family, it is difficult to find um, an appropriate uh, apartment. And we had a, a, a coal, um, an initiative. It came not from a party. It was an initiative to confiscate the apartments of the big housing companies that all the, the housing companies who um, uh, have more than 3,000 apartments, not houses, apartments, to confiscate this, to bring this in a kind of public trust, which is not just state uh, ownership, but a self-administration of the people who live there and uh, councils of the the city population so that not only the persons who live there uh, take advantage of this project but the whole society of the city 
This initiative uh, worked for several years. They became well known. And in 2021, together with the national elections, we had a referendum about this project. And 57% of the voters in Berlin, not in Germany, in, in the state of Berlin, voted in favor of this project with a participation of 74%. So 74% of the persons who had the right to vote voted. And from this 74%, 57 were in, in favor of uh, this confiscation project. Of course, all the political parties without the left party are against this and they try to undermine this. And if this confiscation is ever realized, I have my doubts. But this was such a project in which, which goes beyond capitalism, because it means on the one hand, when you can realize this, you take an important point of capitalist economy out of capitalism. You do it with self-administration. You are not anymore oriented in profits. You are just oriented uh, to cover the costs uh, you have. So it would, on the one hand, take something out of capitalism and it would be a starting point for a new political practice. The self-administration of your economic affairs. And when you can do this with one sector, like housing, you can also try to do it with some other sectors. So it could spread, at least for some time. I don't say that we have to do many, many sectors and suddenly we abolished capitalism. This will be a little bit more complicated. But this confiscation project I think is much more going beyond capitalism than Keynesian economic policy as uh, an answer of uh, a crisis. That's Thank a lot you. to think about. Thank you. All right. Uh, George is next. And then after this, we're going to be closing the stacks. Uh, so, uh, George, if you still have a question, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you're familiar with G.A. Cohen's analysis of uh, Marx as a technological determinist? And if so, what do you think about that interpretation? Okay, I'm not... What was the name you, you said? G.A. Cohen. Ah, Cohen, yes, yes. Um, I, I didn't understand. Yes, I know um, uh, this, and he's not the only one. Who who un, who has this idea uh, as a technological determinist? Um, I think this is completely wrong. Um, it has some truths for Marxist authors, but I would deny this uh, for for Marx himself. <clears throat> for Marx himself, uh, he sees Marx sees technology always in a in a social context um, already at the beginning of um, capital he makes marx makes this distinction between um, economic form and social content for example commodity is the economic form the labor product is the um, material content which you have in every society. Every society needs um, this material content, labor product, but only certain society have this economic form, commodity. Um, similar counts for um, technology. Technology in, in Marx is mainly introduced in uh, his discussion of the production of relative surplus value. So he shows 
that the the emergence, the development of technology is not just a factor of its own. It is a socially determined factor. When you have some historical materialism, which, for example, um, is based on this one and a half page remarks in Marx's preface of 1859, where he says, uh, where he argues we have a um, economic basis or uh, infrastructure, I think it is sometimes called in English, and a superstructure of uh, institutions. And uh, you have the forces of production which change in history and then you, um, uh, you have a change in the relations of production. This you can um, interpret in, in somehow in such a kind of technolog te technological uh, determinism. However, I stress one and a half page in a, in a preface, which has a very certain aim, which was not the big analysis of Marx, um, so I think we also have to to put weight on the different uh, um, analysis of Marx. In capital, I would say it sounds completely different. And, and so far, no technological determinism. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to ask just one final question before uh, we end. Um, one of the major preoccupations with class unity is just the overall state of the contemporary left and it's perceived, what we perceive to be its largely abandonment of class and labor issues. Typically, we're wondering how you perceive the state of the contemporary left. And particularly, I mean, you've spoken earlier about worldview Marxism as like a phenomenon throughout the 20th century. I mean, it makes you question, do we even have worldview Marxism anymore? Or is there a really principled left to be found in, I mean, either in German politics or just internationally to your mind? Okay. Um, first, I must say, must say I cannot speak about the left uh, in the world. I don't know uh, all these left. Of course, I know something about Germany. I know something about some um, European countries, a little bit some uh, Latin American countries where I have been. Um, but I, I would be, I must be very cautious not to pretend that I I know and I can judge uh, a lot. Um, I think the left is probably everywhere fragmented, uh, fragmented in in a lot of um, parts, as well from the the political ideas, as well from. Uh, the political strategies as well from from the background for a part of this left i think there is still worldview marxism uh, very important especially small groups who try to copy uh, historical forms of uh, party foundations they they try to copy uh, traditional socialist communist uh, parties uh, but it's a copy of of forms um, without knowing or without taking in into account the the different political context then you have differences that some parts of the left have a self-understanding as revolutionary left and criticize mainly the others as not revolutionary or not enough revolutionary. You have parts which just uh, say the opposite. Revolution was uh, a dead end. We have to continuously to change. We have to overcome uh, capitalism, but this will be a sequence of smaller or, or bigger um, steps. 
And one um, uh, conflict I I saw, I, I have to admit this, I, I read, of course, uh, the self-description. Oh. I don't know what happened. It was interrupted and it... Uh, gave some problems to to reinstall uh, the connection and I'm sorry uh, about that um you were just about to uh, to comment on uh, class unity's principles when you uh, cut off <laughs> yes uh, this was we, obviously we... too much uh, for the connection when i say <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, I, I commented, I, I read uh, your critique against uh, identity politics and so on, and I said that mainly I agree. I agree also with uh, this educational, this, this the, the approach centered around the working class, with the necessity for educational work. However, um, I had a little bit the feeling, may maybe it was the sound of, of the text, I had a little bit the feeling that in, in, in this text, the working class appears as a kind of object which has to be treated. Um, you have to, to bring some information to the working class, you have to uh, to convince the working class uh, from someone, but there is uh, you on the one hand and the working or class uh, uh, unit, unity class on the one hand and um, the working class on the other hand. Here I, I have um, a somehow different uh, vision. The working class is not at all... Um, a uniform entity. It is uh, split in in many, um, according to many lines, and the the constitution of the working class is also changing with time. From Germany, I can say, and and uh, yeah, this is uh, the point I have to mention in your critique against uh, identity politics. It sounds a little bit as would come identity politics from the universities, from the colleges. So you have on the one hand the academics, on the other hand you have uh, the working class, the trade unions, as if these are two worlds um, which are not connected. At least from my educational work with uh, German trade unions, I know that meanwhile um, there are big parts of uh, the working class which uh, which have a higher education, uh, where also academics uh, are a part of the working class. Um, so I think you cannot simply um, distinguish two cultural fears and say, oh, from the one sphere they have some crazy ideas and the others uh, they they have a completely different um, living conditions uh, so that they don't understand these ideas i think the points are not so simple this is one point one one has to think about and the other point is the working class especially in germany but i suppose also in united states has also a strong right wing. In Germany, we see the rise of this uh, extreme right party, AFD, and they are elected not only, but to a considerable time, uh, part by workers. And uh, when you have such right wing workers, mm -hmm um then you are in opposition to them so it's um and this i think the the sound in on your website of this text from 2019 i would criticize in these two points um you cannot just contrast the academic culture the non-academic culture and you cannot speak of the working class as if it is a uniform 
unity. And the third point, what I said, sounds a little bit like treating the working class as an object. You have to bring knowledge, you have to convince. I must say, when I did workshops uh, with trade unionists, I talked about Marx, about uh, economic policy. The participants could learn something from me, but I also learned from them because I used the opportunity also to speak about the, the concrete um, working conditions, the conflicts in, in companies. So I learned on the one hand, I, I received a lot of concrete information, but I learned also about the treatments of these conflicts uh, by workers. And in so far is my idea about such educational work, it is not so easy that the person who has read a lot of books, studied a lot of Marx, goes somewhere and says, so now I will explain you what is capitalism and how it works and uh, why we have to get rid of it. And because you are the workers, you have the power, you have to do the job. Please uh, don't wait too long. Um, <laughs> we have to, to find a common process of learning, of, of acting. Uh, maybe we, s we have different um, abilities, different competences, but we have to bring them together in a, in a productive way and not in, in such a, a way, here are the teachers, there are the persons who need uh, some teaching, uh, there is this strange academic culture which is so different from the working class culture. These differences are moving. Everything is is moving, melting, like uh, Marx formulated this uh, famously in Communist Manifesto. This counts also for the working class and our relation to, to the working class. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, excellent comments. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's a, a real problem. I think we've we're we're kind of struggling with is just how do you balance that sort of the pedantry versus actually talking to people about, you know, real world kind of things. Um, so maybe just like a, a, a follow up. We were talking about the contemporary left. Um, people are interested to hear your opinion. I'm going to butcher this name, but is it Sarah Wagen Connect? How her name is, is pronounced, <laughs> if you have any thoughts or comments. On like Delinka and so forth. Yeah, Sarah Wagenknecht um, was uh, long times, many years, member of the party Die Linke. She started with a kind, I would say, of, of worldview Marxism, a very simplified Marxism. Then she changed more and more. Uh, instead of Marx, uh, the German economist Ludwig Erhard, a prize democratic uh, politician, chancellor, and the father of the social market economy, what was a very perfect name to hide that we had capitalism. It was just called uh, social market economy, became her hero. And then she did... Uh, a critique of the left party, what was not uh, basically a problem. I also do a lot of critique against the left party, but her critique was uh, a very destructive critique. He, she wrote, for example, in, in 21, just before the um, national elections, not, she wrote, she published a book uh, what was very undermining against the, um, uh, the left party. Nevertheless, with this party, she became member of parliament and could very prominently be present in talk shows, uh, discussion rounds, and so on. Now, finally, she left uh, the left party, founded a new party, 
with her name, Bündnis Sarah Wagenknecht, Coalition Sarah Wagenknecht. So um, you cannot accuse her that she is too modest. Um, this She has many weaknesses, but I think this doesn't belong to it. Um, and there she, she herself says, oh, the difference between uh, left and right, uh, maybe it is old-fashioned, many persons cannot use them, um, so we don't want to, to be the new left after the, she left the left party. So, she is, I, I would not consider her anymore as a part of German left. She is uh, on the other side of of the barricade. It is a kind of very conservative, nationalistic, social welfare ideology uh, she has. Of course, she wants to, to strengthen uh, the welfare state. It is not neoliberal economics with a, a small welfare state, no, but the basis of the welfare state should be a successful German economy and where it should be successful on the world market. So she is completely on this road. We Germans have to be successful in the international competition, in the international struggle. And I think this has nothing to do with any left uh, tendency, even when you when you take left as a very broad uh, thing. Um, Sarah Wagenknecht, uh, in my view, doesn't belong to, to, to anything what can be called left. Thank you. All right, this has been a great discussion, everybody. Our guest is Mikhail Heinrich. Uh, Mikhail, thank you so much for talking to us today. I know uh, us in Chicago look forward to meeting with you in the couple of weeks from now. And uh, yeah, if you have more interest in uh, Class Unity, our political education program, other activities we're involved in, it's classunity.org. Check it out. Let us know what you think and uh, stop by. We'd love to have you and to some of our talks, some of our uh, book groups. And yeah, join the conversation with us. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody.